Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National George C. Marshall Museum and Library for another Marshall Moment. We are pleased to have as our guest today, author Francis Gary Powers, Jr., son of the famous Cold War aviator, Francis Gary Frank Powers. Mr. Powers is the founder and chairman emeritus of the Cold War Museum, located in Vent Hill, Virginia, near Washington, D.C. He started the museum in 1996 to honor Cold War veterans, preserve Cold War history, and educate future generations about the time period. As chairman of the Presidential Advisory Committee for the Cold War theme study, he works with the National Park Service and leading Cold War experts to identify historic Cold War sites for purposes of commemoration, interpretation, and preservation. Recently, he served as a technical advisor to the Steven Spielberg film project, Bridge of Spies, the story of James Donovan, played by actor Tom Hanks, who brokered the 1962 spy exchange between Soviet spy Rudolf Abel and your late father. Gary, your father, Frank Powers, became a leading international figure overnight when the U-2 spy plane that he was piloting was downed by Soviet missiles on May Day, 1960. He was captured immediately by the KGB, subjected to a show trial, and imprisoned, all of which created a major international incident. Soviet authorities eventually released him in exchange for Rudolf Abel, who was a KGB spy. When he returned to the U.S., he was exonerated of any wrongdoing while imprisoned in Russia, yet due to unfavorable press and the government's unwillingness to heartily defend him, a cloud of controversy lingered until his untimely death in 1977. Gary, first I want to thank you for fully capturing this incredible story in your excellent book, Spy Pilot, which has just recently been published. And second, thanks for spending time with us today at Marshall. Your book, Spy Pilot, which I uh, just finished reading last night, thoroughly, and I thoroughly enjoyed reading it, is part biography and part autobiography. So what compelled you to write it, and what compelled you to write it in the way that you did? Well, uh, it was a labor of love to start with. Um, uh, growing up in the shadow of my father, my dad dies when I'm 12 years old. I find out about this by coming home and learning about this on the evening news. No one would tell me that my father died. So I'm introverted throughout high school. I come out of my shell in college. I am curious. I want to find out more about my father. So in college, I start to do research. And one thing leads to the next. First, I start talking, uh, researching my father, talking to family members. The more I learn, there are more questions. Then I start talking to Cold War veterans, people who flew with my father, worked with my father, trying to find out about the U-2 incident, the U-2 program. The more I learned, the more questions there were. Realized I had to find out more about the Cold War to understand the U-2 program to learn more about my dad. So this book is basically 25 years worth of research. It helps to dispel the misinformation that's out there. My father, when he came home, was uh, surrounded by controversy. Some people thought he was a hero. Other people thought he was a traitor. Some people thought he defected, landed the plane intentionally. Uh, uh, um, some people thought that he uh, betrayed his country and collaborated with the enemy. So I wanted to write this book to set the record straight. It basically takes Dad's reputation from infamy and controversy in the 60s to that of an American hero today. And the book goes through the process of how that transpired, well, how my father's death affected the family, how my father's shoot down affected the family. It helps to show the truth behind the sensational headlines of the time. And so I thought it was very important to have the Powers family's version, my version of what took place for the historical record. You know, one of the fascinating things about the book is that the foreword is written by Sergei Khrushchev, the son of the former Soviet premier who imprisoned your father. Yes. How did that happen? Well, um, Sergei Khrushchev and I first met back in about 1996. We were at a conference in Boda, Norway. Boda, above the Arctic Circle, 
is where the U-2 of May 1st, that mission, would have landed had it been successful. I was at a conference, uh, a Cold War conference, the first Cold War conference I'm aware of that took place uh, what, within five years after the end of the Cold War. So Sergei Khrushchev and I meet at that conference. We have both a little suspicious of each other, a little you know, eyeing up and down, trying to figure out who these people are, who this guy is. He has the same feelings towards me um, because of all the uh, uh, Cold War theories. I mean, we have the Soviets, the Americans, the tension, the threat of a nuclear war during the Cold War period, uh, the misinformation and the propaganda in both of our countries. We have suspicions of each other. So after sitting down and talking to Sergei Khrushchev, we realize we're doing the same thing. We're trying to honor our fathers, we're trying to set the record straight, and we're trying to be historians. We want to know the truth behind the scenes of what took place. So we hit it off. And from that moment on, we've been friends. Um, I've been up to his house in Rhode Island. I've had dinners and, and a couple of drinks with him at different occasions in Washington, D.C. He served on panel discussions uh, of uh, museum events that we've hosted, such as the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, where he was a panelist. And so when I was writing my book, I reached out to him and, and thought it would be really good for him to write the forward to get that perspective. It's a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that. The question I've got is why do you think the Russians never tortured your father while under interrogation since they did consider him a spy? that torture was a common KGB practice. Yes. Um, I believe that my father was not tortured by the KGB at this time for one specific reason. He was too high profile an individual. The world knew that the Soviets had him in captivity. And I believe that the Soviets, specifically Khrushchev, the Politburo, uh, the KGB in particular, wanted to show the world how humane they were how they treated the spies that they caught in their country, propaganda to further embarrass the United States. As you will recall, the Americans, the United States, had executed the Rosenbergs in the 50s. They had given Rudolf Abel, a Soviet spy captured in the late 50s in New York City, a 30-year prison sentence. The Soviets end up giving my father 10 years in prison because they are such a humbled and nice country. That's the reason they didn't torture him. He was too high profile. They wanted to show the world how humane they were, how nice they were, how they treated the prisoners of the spies they caught in their country. The, another interesting aspect of the story is that you two pilots all carried a hollowed out silver dollar that contained a poisonous pin, a prick from which would cause instant death. How did the false story get propagated that if captured pilots were expected to use the pen to avoid spilling top secrets, say, of torture or subject to intense interrogation. interrogation. And sort of the follow-up question to that is, uh, why did uh, Steven Spielberg allow this fabrication to remain in his movie, Bridge of Spies? Well, to answer the first part of the question, um, when the pilots are recruited and they sign the contract that they're working for the CIA to do the overflights, they are told if you're caught, you will be tortured. Here is a way to alleviate the pain and suffering. One prick, 70 seconds later, you will be dead. Uh, in the event of torture that you can't withstand, it is an option for you to use. They explained it's optional to take, optional to use at the pilot's discretion. The orders given to the pilots upon capture are, I'm going to paraphrase, if the pilot's captured, they should have a cooperative attitude toward their captors. They're perfectly free to talk to them about their missions, basically taking photographs over the Soviet Union. They should not talk about specifications of the airplane, the equipment on board. So they didn't want them to talk about the equipment or details of the um, uh, things they knew outside of the program. So when my father is caught, he has this device on him. But before he had, uh, before he ca um, before they get the device, he has to do the following. He is parachuting out of the sky. He's contemplating using this device. He doesn't know what to expect when he's landing. It's in a hidden silver dollar. My dad looks at this device and says, "That is really a dumb place to hide something. It's the first thing that a Russian's going to want as a souvenir." He takes the pin out. He throws the dollar away. He puts the pin in his flight suit pocket. On the third strip search, the KGB find the device. 
At that point in time, he goes, ooh, be very careful. He did not want to have a murder conviction on top of an espionage conviction. He was already in enough trouble. So the Soviets test the device on a dog. The dog dies in 20 seconds of asphyxiation. Um, Khrushchev comes up at one of his press conferences and says, oh, look at these evil Americans give their spy pilots to commit suicide with. This one wanted to live to see another day. And from that moment on, Dad was ordered to commit suicide. And that false information, the fake news of the time, continues to circulate today. Just because Dad had a poison tip needle on him does not mean he was ordered to use it. It was, again, optional to take, optional to use at the pilot's discretion. In regards to the Steven Spielberg, it is Hollywood. So Spielberg is using his genius for dramatic effect, artistic liberty, uh, and some embellishing. So what's more dramatic than a poison-tipped needle given to a pilot? The KGB, look, Gary, the, so the Americans don't like you. They wanted you to kill uh, yourself. And again, it propagates that misinformation. So while the Steven Spielberg movie is accurate in the big picture, the details of each scene are not 100% correct. Now, the Powers family is very uh, impressed with the movie. We're very uh, glad that they did it. Uh, it's a very good movie, very historically accurate in the big picture. But again, the details of each scene are not 100% correct. And the final thing with the movie, Spielberg does his artistic liberties. He does his dramatic effects. Um, he propagates some misinformation within the film. But at the very end, he honors my father as a hero to our country. So he actually does help to set the record straight. Great. Thank you. Why do you think the various agencies of the U.S. government treated your father so poorly for so long? Why were, there never, why were they never assertive uh, in coming to his defense and in vouching for his obvious courage? Well, you have to remember that this is the height of the Cold War. Um, it was easier at the time to blame the pilot than to have to admit the Soviets were more advanced than we thought they were. They did have the capability to shoot down the U-2. But in 1960 in June, one month after the shoot down, Eisenhower, Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, Kelly Johnson, the de designer of the airplane, all three, as if from a script, and I do believe it was a script, all said at different public appearances, the Soviets don't have the technology, there had to be a flame out, it had to be the pilot's fault, something happened to bring the plane down lower, where then it was hit by a MiG or a missile. They couldn't bring themselves to admit that the Soviets were more advanced than we thought they were. When my father gets home, the misinformation is already circulated in the press. In the press, there were editorials written that my father defected. He landed the plane intact. He spilled his guts and told the Soviets everything he knew, or he hadn't followed orders and committed suicide, all of which were mistruths. He was publicly cleared by the CIA. He was publicly cleared by the uh, Senate who did a Senate Select Committee hearing about this incident, but he was not cleared in the court of public opinion because of the misinformation that had been circulating around, which again is one of the reasons I wrote the book, to help set the record straight. You mentioned in your book that on March 6, 1962, your father was waiting for a car to take him to the White House to meet personally with President Kennedy. The meeting was mysteriously canceled at the last moment. You suspect that the meeting was killed by the President's brother, U.S. Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Why do you think that? Well, first off, this is the story my mom told me as a young kid, and I have to believe my mom. Um, the second thing is what I just said about the height of the Cold War, easier to blame the uh, pilot than it is to further embarrass the uh, President of the United States, who had been caught lying, saying that it was a weather research flight. And in fact, it was a, uh, an American CIA spy flight. So when my father gets home, he's cleared by the CIA. He goes to the Senate Select Committee hearing. After the committee hearing, he's supposed to go and see President Kennedy. His brother, uh, Kennedy's brother, John F. Uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, no, I'm sorry, Robert, Robert F. F. Kennedy, um, is trying to make a name for himself. Robert F. Kennedy wanted to try my father as a traitor to our country. Um, he told his brother, basically, you don't want to be associated with Gary Powers. You don't know what's going to happen at the Senate Select Committee hearing. Uh, if he is a branded a traitor, you do not want to have pictures with him. You need to cancel this meeting. That's what I believe happened. Thank you. And what was your father's relationship 
with CIA Director Alan Dulles, it seemed like there was some um, great empathy coming from uh, Director Dulles during this period. Right. Um, first of all, um, my father and Alan Dulles were, were not colleagues per se. They were not close friends. They did not hang in the same circles. My father was an employee of the CIA when Alan Dulles was the head of the CIA, and that was their relationship. When my father gets caught, imprisoned, exchanged, he's now front page news, they do end up meeting when he gets returned home after the spy exchange for Rudolf Abel. So they did not have any type of a, a formal relationship. At one event, and I want to say in Beverly Hills, uh, in about 1963 or 64, uh, Alan Dulles is there with Kelly Johnson. They're on stage, they're doing a program. My father and my mother are in the audience. Alan Dulles, off script, recognizes my father and basically tells the audience of CIA employees and guests that um, dad did everything he was supposed to do and there was great ad and that Alan Dulles had great admiration for my father. So it was basically a, a pat on the back, good job for your country. That's very interesting. And so why do you think Dulles' ultimate replacement at CIA, John McCone, was skeptical of your father's story. He takes a completely different view, apparently. Well, uh, John McCone, who uh, replaced Alan Dulles as head of the CIA, had in one point in time basically said that my father had defected, my father had landed the plane, my father had done something wrong. He did not want to eat crow. He wanted to be right. So when my father gets cleared by the CIA and cleared by the Senate, John McCone just, just can't have that. So he commissions the Pettyman Commission, Judge Pettyman, to investigate, reinvestigate what has already been investigated and cleared. And the Pettyman Commission comes back and says, Mr. McCone, we've reinvestigated this. Powers did everything he was supposed to do. He followed orders to the T. He did not give out any secret information. He did not defect. He did not uh, betray our country. He acted uh, according to his contract. He's entitled to his back pay. He did everything he was supposed to do. And reluctantly, McCone had to buy into that. But there's a, another piece of this that I need to mention. All of the U-2 pilots in 1963 were awarded the Intelligence Star for Valor, except my father. McCone is in office at this time. Right before McCone retires in April of 65, my father is called in to have the award presented to him as an individual. The certificate's dated 63. Is presented in '65. It's That's the last thing that McCone had to do before he left office. Fascinating. Do you think that with the various high honors posthumously awarded your father, that his actions in the U-2 incident have now been fully vindicated? Why do you think perhaps negative uh, thoughts still linger in the public? Sure. Um, my, father has, uh, my father's reputation has come full circle. And as the book describes, it was controversial uh, in the 1960s. He's now considered an American hero in the 21st century. But it took some 50 years for the record to be set straight. And it took that long because of the Cold War. It took that long to get declassified documents, declassif I mean classified documents declassified, to find out the truth of what took place. Uh, up until 1998, it was a CIA civilian mission that my father was on. And civilians are not entitled to the POW medal. They're not entitled to military medals. They're civilians. So once 1998, the declassification conference happened, it showed that it was a joint CIA Air Force program, that the U-2 program with the CIA pilots could not exist one without the other. The CIA was instrumental in the targets and what they wanted to bring back as far as information, but it was the Air Force that was instrumental with the air bases, the fuel, the logistics behind the scenes. So for all intent and purposes, it was a military operation. In the Cold War, it couldn't be a military operation. If it was a military pilot uh, in a military plane flying over a foreign hostile country, it would be an act of war. That's why uh, Eisenhower put it in charge of the CIA, a civilian agency, so that it would be espionage and not provocation for World War III. So my father's reputation started to come out of the shadows once the declassified documents came to the surface. It showed it was a military operation. 
uh, the documents also stated that he did everything he was supposed to do, he followed orders, and that they considered him a hero to our country. I present this evidence that I uncovered to the Air Force Review Board. They review it. They agree with my findings after first denying them, because I first started writing this in 96, 97, prior to the declassification process. But in 1998, once I put the pieces of the puzzle together, they said, yes, Mr. Powers, thank you for bringing this to our attention. This is what we're here to do, to correct the records once material has been brought to us for review that is accurate and factual. So once that happened, they were able to award my father posthumously with the POW medal for his incarceration, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and George Tenet awarded my father a special medal from the CIA, the Director's Medal, for extreme fidelity and courage in line of duty. So we thought that was great. Dad's honor has been, uh, 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 is whole, his reputation's vindicated, he's a hero to our country. 10 years go by, 12 years go by, in 2012, the Air Force steps up to the plate and posthumously awards my father with the Silver Star. So as a family, we are very honored, very humbled, very grateful to know that our government stepped up to the plate, helped to set the record straight, and helped to show that my father did everything he was supposed to do. It goes to show it's never too late to set the record straight. And we're very grateful to our government for having, that, having done that. Yeah, I also happen to think it's because of your incredible efforts Thank over you. the years, too. And any father would be very proud to have a son like you. Thank you, Gary, for being with us today. All right, Russ. Thank Great. you very much. Thanks. Appreciate that. Sure. You bet.